The epoxide ring is interesting because it contains both an electrophile and a leaving group built into one functional group. And so the epoxide is the three-membered ring shown here, a three-membered ring containing oxygen. And you'll recall from our discussion of the cycloalkanes that three-membered rings, and the epoxide is no exception, contain a great deal of strain energy. And so relief of this strain energy, for instance, by an SN2 type process, will tend to be thermodynamically favored. And in fact, we can observe this thermodynamic advantage in the reactions of epoxides versus reactions of ethers. So whereas nucleophilic substitutions of ethers are rare, in which we displace an alkoxide like so, this is quite rare, epoxides do this process easily. And that's because the epoxide has an additional 25 kilocalories per mole of strain energy embedded within its three-membered ring structure. This leads to a higher energy starting material and a smaller activation energy for substitution processes at the electrophilic carbons of an epoxide. Under acidic conditions, protonation can contribute to the reactivity of epoxides by lowering the energy of the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. The LUMO of an epoxide is the carbon-oxygen sigma star orbital, and protonation of this oxygen, taking it from neutral to positive, lowers the energy of that lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, rendering the epoxide more reactive. The protonated epoxide is then dying to be attacked by a nucleophile, typically a neutral nucleophile also in solution with the acid, and via an SN2 type process, displacement of the epoxide to form an alcohol then takes place. Notice that the nucleophile attacks at the more substituted carbon, although this is an SN2 type process. We can rationalize this result by considering resonance structures of the protonated epoxide. Notice that we can envision that some of the positive charge on the protonated epoxide is actually shared between oxygen and one of the electrophilic carbons. So pushing a sigma bond all the way to oxygen reveals that some of the positive charge may be carried by one of the electrophilic carbons. If we consider which of the two electrophilic carbons, the one on the bottom or the one on the top, will be better at stabilizing that positive charge, based on the trends we learned about cation stability, we would conclude that this top carbon would be the one that would better stabilize the positive charge. As a result, this is what we would call the more positive carbon out of the two. And this is the carbon to which lone pair containing nucleophiles are going to be attracted. Under basic conditions, the nucleophile tends to be the more reactive partner of the two, leading to a conventional SN2 type pathway for additions of nucleophiles to epoxides under basic conditions. And so we see here, when methoxide adds to the epoxide as shown, it adds at the less substituted carbon, because sterically this carbon is more available and more open than the more substituted carbon on the other side here. This leads to cleavage of the CO bond and the formation of an O minus, or an alkoxide. Proton transfer from methanol then generates the nucleophile again and gives us our product. A variety of nucleophiles can react with epoxides under basic conditions to give beta functionalized alcohols. And so we see treatment with a thiolate, sodium thiolate, gives a beta thiol Treatment with cyanide gives a beta cyano compound or a beta nitrile. Treatment with an alkyne or an acetylide anion gives us a beta alkynyl alcohol or a homopropargilic alcohol. And finally, treatment with ammonia, interestingly, gives us this beta amino alcohol shown here. So there are a variety of functional and structural motifs that reactions of epoxides open us up to. Anytime you see a beta alcohol with a functional group two carbons away from the alcohol, be thinking of a potential epoxide opening transformation. And remember that under acidic or basic conditions, you can accomplish the opening of an epoxide.